All right. Well, welcome everyone to the future of sustainable kitchen design induction cooking. This is our first session of the year in 2022. And I say this every year, you know I do, but we are starting the new year off, right? We really are. This is this is the foundation. If we don't do this, we don't get this right. It's going to be an uphill battle from there in regards to sustainable housing and, and making our you know world more sustainable. We got to do it right. So I'm really glad to be having this session. If you're new, uh, again, we are the Green Home Institute. We're a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. My name is Brett Little. I'm the program manager here, and I will be your moderator today. As always, our courses are approved for a multitude of continuing education units. Among them is our own internal certified green home professional designation. This course is approved for energy and health out of the five pillars. You've also got AIA health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. I am super excited to announce the launch of our certified green home professional designation. If you become a member, not only do you get instant access to all these webinars, you don't have to sign up, but you can take that course and become a professional at no cost. Otherwise, there's a fee. Uh, I'll send you a little link to the training itself and you can check it out. And all the videos are available on YouTube um, anyway. And before we get going, I want to say a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, Mitsubishi Electric. Uh, they have systems that are going to help you go all electric uh, air source heat pump systems that are both ducted. They can swap right out for gas furnaces or they have ducted mini split systems. If you still want that efficiency of the mini split, but a little bit of ducts. Uh, or traditional mini split systems. All these things can be hidden behind the walls so your clients don't have to see them sticking out. Just take it from me, uh, it is super cold right now and I can promise you my house is running 100% electrically up here in the uh, Midwest, climate zone five, negative temperatures. We're still warm, I'm not dead. There is heat in the air out there and I, I, I'm a, it, it really works. So uh, I, I, I promise you it does. So, uh, you know, again, they've got the, the mini split systems uh, that you can check out. They're some of the most efficient systems, just short of geothermal. They've got the ceiling cassettes that can be hidden so you don't have to see them. They've got the dry mode so that when there's issues with humidity uh, and it's not calling for cooling in the shoulder seasons, it works that way too. They've got their pros out there, their diamond contractors. Give them a call. They go through their training. They understand how to sell and help you uh, uh, maintain and install this equipment. You can learn more over at MitsubishiComfort.com. And then thanks to our second tier sponsor, Panasonic Ventilation. They're going to meet you, help you meet all of your ventilation needs. Uh, bath fans, range hoods, supplies, energy recovery ventilators, smart ventilation. I can tell you if I burn a little bit of food right now, my... Uh, uh, Panasonic Cosmo Systems detects that burnt food and turns my range hood on through their very quiet uh, whisper hood range. So it's pretty cool stuff. I don't even have to think about it. Uh, it gets that PM 2.5 right out of the air. So um, again, uh, I'm going to hand it off now, and I'm super excited uh, to have the renowned uh, chef here, electrification uh, chef, uh, Chris with us, he's the founder and culinary sustainability consultant for Forward Dining Solutions. So um, Chris, I really am excited to have you joining us here and um, you know, please do uh, take it away. All right, thank you so much, everybody. I'm gonna sh share my screen here one second, make sure it sounds on. All right, so uh, thank you guys for being here. This is very, very important to me. A uh, huge passion project of mine, obviously, uh, so much so that I made it my career. Uh, my name is Chef Chris Galarza. I'm the founder and culinary sustainability consultant of Forward Dining Solutions, and I'm a national expert in commercial kitchen electrification. Uh, we're, today, we're going to be talking about you know, what is going on in the United States uh, in terms of electrification, why it's important, and what are some solutions out there to get, to get chefs cooking more efficient and uh, and even healthier. So a little bit of background on us. So Forward Dining Solutions is a minority owned company started in 2019. And we help designers sustainably build kitchens of the future. We're able to kind of bridge that gap between uh, the, the design, you know, 
the, the design language and the culinary language, right? We, we can, we bridge that gap. We're able to get projects moving forward. Uh, what sets us apart is that we're truly the only firm with a real world working knowledge of electric kitchen technologies. I myself ran an all electric kitchen for nearly six years. Um, I've uh, ran both gas and electric and it's just amazing. So I myself had the experience of actually working on the equipment, understanding what are the, what are the pros and cons? How does it, actually perform when you're cooking for hundreds of people, when you're cooking for banquets or whatever the case is. Uh, my partner and I, we are experienced in all facets of, of dining from five-star, five-diamond resorts to small-scale restaurants. We uh, combined, we have nearly 40 years of experience in the industry, working for master chefs, culinary Olympians, you name it. Uh, we're also experienced in working with multidisciplinary teams to achieve a sustainability goal, uh, whether that be you know trying to eliminate fossil fuels, trying to make your building you know, more efficient or even just out of concern for your employees and trying to make a healthier ecosystem for them. So I'm sure you guys know what's going on in the news, but I'm going to recap what happened in the last four months to give you an understanding of why this is kind of ramping up. 2021 was a banner year for electrification and decarbonization. So in September, uh, President Biden proposed the first safety standards and tapped OSHA to kind of develop regulations to help protect workers from extreme heat. Uh, so warehouses, kitchens, things of that nature. And it's never been done before. It's been discussed before, but never on a, on a national scale. I know Cal OSHA started this process probably in 2015, 2019, between that time. But this is going to be on a national scale. And they're proposing uh, a regulation threshold of 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which means any kitchen or any indoor environment that goes beyond 82 degrees Fahrenheit is subject to fines, is subject to having OSHA come in and kind of be all up in their business. Also, Energy Star will no longer recommend gas appliances for its, for its next most efficient list, which means, uh, as we all know, if you are going to be LEED certified as a building, you have to first get Energy Star certification. So if you're going to have a gas kitchen, it's going to be that much harder to get that certification to then go into LEED. So very, very important steps. Uh, we all know that uh, Berkeley was the first city in America to ban gas for new construction. Well, now Ithaca took that a step further last year and banned gas and for all buildings, get uh, new construction, uh, mold buildings, it doesn't matter. 100% of their buildings are gonna be decarbonized, which is a huge milestone for, for the movement. And then right after that, New York City says, hey, we're gonna ban, we're, we're gonna ban gas as well. Uh, we're not gonna be shown up by, by those people on the West Coast. And as an East Coast chef, I'm very, it was really, really awesome to see New York represent. And then this year started off with New York State saying we're going to be the first state to ban gas. So huge moves happening in just the last four months alone. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The 2020s will be the most influential decade of our lifetime. It's going to dictate how not only as a country, but as a planet, we move forward and how uh, what kind of world we're going to leave behind. So. That being said, I want you guys to imagine a world because there are still folks who are really against the uh, the transition away from gas. So, just to highlight how ridiculous it is, we're gonna we're gonna imagine a world where all of our electronics are gas powered, and uh, it's gonna be a little silly, but I think it's really important to highlight the the plethora of, of products out there that are electric. So let's uh, let's watch this. So I know that's uh, probably a little bit silly for uh, for some of you, but I think it's really in important to contextualize the argument when we're talking about electrification. And truth be told, about ninety percent of the products in our kitchens or in our in our lives, probably more, are right on, on on electricity. So why are we having this conversation? Because really, just we just need a few more pieces of equipment to get there. Right. And it's those few more pieces of equipment that are creating the most pollution, not only in our kitchens, but in our buildings and then um, 
in our atmosphere and all and and, and all in all sorts of places. But what are the real world health considerations of working with uh, we're we're we're, we're, we're going to call it fossil gas because it's not natural at all to you know explode uh, whatever underneath the ground, capture this invisible gas and set it on fire. There's nothing natural about that. So what's the real world health consideration of working with fossil gases? Well, first and foremost, you have carbon dioxide, nitrous, uh, sorry, nut nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, formaldehyde, particulates, PM 2.5, like soot, smoke, things of that nature that really kind of do harm in the lungs. And by eliminating all this, we actually are able to not only improve the indoor air quality for, for our guests, but in the home, uh, these particulates are one of the leading causes of childhood rates of asthma. So if you were to eliminate these sources, you would create a healthier um, healthier lives for our children as well. But more importantly, carbon monoxide. And we're going to focus a little bit on carbon monoxide because that is what everyone has sensors for in their home and in the restaurants and things like that. Uh, so what is carbon monoxide? Carbon monoxide is an odorless, colorless toxin that in outdoor concentrations go anywhere from 0 0.03 to 2.5 parts per million. Now, federal standards dictate that it cannot exceed nine parts per million because if so everyone goes indoors until they find out where the source of co the contamination is but truth be told when we're cooking with this uh with this gas uh it's not uncommon for it to far exceed 200 parts per million so that's how egregious it is when we're cooking with this fossil gas and symptoms of which which i want you guys to really remember this because it's going to come up later uh, which I didn't understand until later, but nausea, vomiting, headache, lightheadedness, those are all symptoms of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. And complications of which are brain damage, permanent brain damage, cardiac damage, and even death. So what is life like for a chef in a professional kitchen? Well, first and foremost, it's hot. You are working at breakneck speeds around things that can cut you, that can burn you, that can seriously maim you. I've seen people have to be rushed to hospitals because of uh, because of accidents. We're working at such a high speed that one mistake can land you in the hospital, could, could probably irreparably change your life. So it's very, very important that we work as efficiently, uh, as, as, uh, as smoothly as possible. And uh, when working with gas, you see that, yeah, it looks cool. There's flames and all this stuff, but what's going on under the hood, so to speak? Um, I can tell you from my own experience that that's not a fun environment to be in. It may look cool to take a picture of it and show these action shots, but truth be told, I, I can tell you stories, but I'm going to tell you just one. I remember being um, a chef at a, at a restaurant here in Pittsburgh. And I remember looking down after our first rush and my thermometer, my chef coat was reading 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, when, uh, when you're doing that, your body fights you every step of the way. And after our first rush, we would all be clamoring to get to the bathroom because we were nauseous. We wanted to throw up. Uh, we were not feeling well. And that's be, and we didn't, we, I didn't realize it till most recently, but because we were exposed to so many toxins. Right. Hey, yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, you, you, uh, you, you mentioned the part about sort of it's, bu it's busy in the kitchen and you could make one mistake. And, and I almost feel like cooking like that in just your household with kids running around the cell phone ringing, same mm -hmm. kind of situation there, too. I mean, have you heard anything like that as well? It's not obviously as stressful, right? You're, but, you know, you got to get your family fed, right? So <laughs> Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean how many times have you heard stories of kids just reaching up and grabbing something and burning themselves, mm. things like that. When you're working with it in an in electric space that doesn't exist. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little later, but it's a, it's a much safer space to be in. Mm. And when you're working with gas, not only are you putting out this toxin in, into your, into your home, but you're also offering an opportunity for something to catch on fire, whether it be a towel sitting too close to a flame, which even I've done, um, whether it be, you know, you grabbing something without a towel because in the kitchen, you have to assume everything's hot. So unless you're so you grab everything with towels and hope that, you know, you don't burn yourself. But that's that's a great question. Um, transitioning from gas, what is it like to work in an electric kitchen? Well, truth be told, much, much more comfortable. And I found um, some some changes that I didn't expect to see when we went, when we made that change. Um, so in an electric kitchen, far cooler, 
and we'll, we have data to support that, but we're far, far cooler. And because of that, my staff was much more comfortable uh, because of that. Uh, this is at a university, by the way. So, so my staff was much more comfortable. And because of that, they got along a lot better. There was less infighting. And because it was an open kitchen, there was um, much, there was much better guest facing interactions, which translated to us having the number one rated dining facility in all three campuses for that, for that particular school. Uh, so we, and, and what the numbers on that was, we were rated 4.8 over five, oh, sorry, out of five, uh, when the rest of the, the rest of the dining halls were, were getting 3.2 or lower. So we were far and away the better dining facility. And I, and I wouldn't say it's because of food. I'd say, because we were, we, we connected with the students because when you come there as a student, you're leaving home for the first time. So going there and being, and being welcomed into a place that is comfortable, that is serving healthy food, that is, ser- that is be- being done so in a healthy environment really makes a difference. And I will even say that sometimes it works a little too, uh, t- too efficient. Brett, I know that it's cold out there, just like it is out here in Pittsburgh. Uh, my staff at times would be wearing their winter coats while they were working. Uh, because there was no thermal sources of heat, uh, it was it, it get pretty chilly. So it's, it was a kind of a byproduct that we didn't expect. Is that it's so efficient, it's actually chillier than than uh, than we expected. So touching on that thermal comfort in the kitchen, what is thermal comfort? Well, Ashray did a study, and the first they had to answer the question, "What is thermal comfort?" So they broke it down into three into three categories, things that are out of everyone's control, like the, like the air velocity, the humidity of the outside. Uh, then as an operative, uh, as an owner of the building, you control the radiant temperature and the air temperature of the building. And as an individual, your clothing, your activity, activity level, those are all things that contribute to thermal comfort. So when they did this study, they tested over 100 kitchens for a week in both summer and winter conditions, and they did it in three separate categories, cooking, prepping, and dishwashing. And what they found, by by the way, they also had to to kind of develop what that threshold was, and it's 68 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit is that thermal comfort range. Um, They found that the, the kitchens that were comfortable were either really cold, like it was winter, it was uh, during prepping, during cooking, sorry, during dishwashing, but during cooking, it was far past that thermal comfort range, as you can see. And here's another, here's another, uh, uh, another, uh, fit, another table showing that where the top highest mark is a three and you can see kitchens far surpassing that. So those are conditions that we're, that we find ourselves in. And it's a uh, pretty, pr- pr- pretty hellish. Now here is a example of my kitchen that, that I was running. And uh, we took this in September, between September 9th and 16th of 2019. And that was a quote unquote, perfect summer day. So sorry, summer week, not a cloud in sight. It was sunny, it was beautiful. It was what everyone wants to have. It was mid to, mid to high eighties. It was, it was perfect. Uh, but in my kitchen, it never hit 74 degrees Fahrenheit. It was cooler in my kitchen during production next to my ovens than it was outside in a quote unquote perfect day, a perfect week. Uh, truth be told, it was, it only spiked above 72 degrees Fahrenheit once it stayed between 69 and 71 on average. So really, really uh, impressive display as far as thermal comfort goes. So we talked about electric kitchens. We talked about what's going on in the news. We talked about uh, thermal comfort and all this fun stuff, but let's dive deep into what electric kitchens are. What do they consist of? What does it actually mean for induction and electricity? Uh, so first and foremost, what is induction? Well, it's, it's not, it's not gas, right? It's not coils or radio, which I call coils 2.0, although they're more efficient. Um, they're slow. They have to convert the electrical energy coming in into heat energy with induction. You don't have to, it's kind of like, power straight straight to the wheels as you can see uh only the pan itself is getting hot uh the the photo on the left has ice totally you know still frozen obviously it's ice and the water is boiling boiling next to it because the only thing getting hot is the ferromagnetic molecules within the pan um so what what is induction it's a safer way of cooking it's a way of cooking using electromagnetic current uh to heat your cooking vessel it's an easy way to meet sustainability goals as well as save yourself some money so what does induction, like how does induction work is it, 
it um, it creates an, so you have a tightly wound copper coil where it sends electricity through it, which then creates an eddy current, which oscillates the ferromagnetic qual, uh, molecules in the pan, which then uh, creates heat from the inside out. Uh, metal has a very linear structure. The metallic ions are able to pass electricity and heat through very, very easily. So when you oscillate and you get this heat from, from the pan, it gets hot very fast. Uh, the quickest way to understand how that works is a microwave in your home. So it sends these tiny microwaves into your food and it gets that those water molecules so excited, so happy, they're bouncing around. And it, while they're doing, they're creating molecular friction. So it creates heat on a molecular level from the inside out of your food. And that's how you cook food in the microwave. Now, induction cooking pros and cons. Um, let's focus on cons because as Americans, we're, we can be pretty pessimistic. Um, cons, the initial cost. How, how much more is this going to cost uh, as opposed to gas counterparts? Uh, say you are doing a six burner gas range from say South Bend, you're going to pay about $32,000. Uh, that could have gone up because of the, the supply chain. But last I checked was $32,000 roughly, 32 to 34 for, for that. That same company doing six burner induction was going to cost you about $38,000. So in the grand scheme of a project, that is not a big sum of money. And, uh, and that could often be offset by tax credits and things of that nature. Um, but what are the compatible cookware? Uh, if you're a restaurant, you probably have an odor that buys cheap aluminum equipment, right? Cheap aluminum pans. Uh, and that doesn't stand up to fire and it's never going to work on induction. It has to be metal that or pans that are able to uh, attract magnets. So you want to test it out, grab, grab a magnet from your fridge or whatnot and toss it on your pan. If it sticks, you're good to go. Brett, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. I heard sure. that more often than not, uh, at least in the residential set mm -hmm. settings, your pans are probably most likely in compliance with induction than not. What, what is your experience on that? Uh, I, that's absolutely correct. Because when you are... Um, a manufacturer, it's a lot easier to produce one type of pan than produce different pans based mm -hmm. on what someone might be cooking. Uh, mm -hmm. They just don't want that kind of that kind of stuff just sitting around in the warehouse. So they make one pan that fits all, and that's how it goes. In the restaurants, mm -hmm. they have you know just your your bronze, silver, gold uh, pans, if you will. Like you can get the cheap stuff, you can get the great stuff. Uh, but at home, you'd be surprised that most, if not all, of your pans are ready to go. Mm -hmm. And if you're using cast iron a lot or Dutch ovens, you, that's, that's perfect. Well, and I'm, I'm glad you said that. And, and maybe this is a much more loaded question that we want to get into a little bit later, but, you know, on the health side of, you know, nonstick and PFAS and that whole ordeal, mm -hmm. I, I realize that could, that's a whole nother can of worms here, but just briefly, is it, you know, can we avoid PFAS to some extent with induction or does it tend to lead more to those kinds of pans? I guess if, if that's no, an easy answer. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Uh, it really, what they put on the pans is really th their discretion. You buy what you want, but as uh -huh. far as like the only thing that we're concerned about is the, the portion that is touching the actual surface. Mm -hmm. So I've seen copper pans that have like a, a piece of, or th th that have like a magnetic bottom. So it's still copper, still beautiful, but it's able to work on induction. So uh, really, it's it's uh, it's up to you. It's up to the manufacturer. But uh, I think uh, the consumer is going to be making those decisions, uh, good, those, those good decisions. And uh, I think that it does on induction. It doesn't really matter what's you know what's coating the pan. That's only matters what's what's underneath. But thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, last con, uh, electrical capacity. What's what's the retrofit hurdle? Are you going to have to put in new panels, upgrade your service, things of that nature? Uh, that's where you can also incur some costs. But what are the pros of induction cooking? Very high efficient. We're talking eighty three to nine, sorry eighty to ninety three percent, which is versus thirty five to fifty percent. And I want to stress that truly, it's thirty five percent for for uh for gas i put it into 50 because i heard that there was some ranges that were up to that high and i thought that it would be nice to give gas the best possible opportunity to stack up against induction and we'll go into those numbers shortly uh but it heats up very very quickly 
precise temperature adjustments. You can set it to the degree that you want, depending on, on what piece of equipment you have. Uh, no idling equipment, which means there's no just draining energy just because it's on. Uh, no combustion, which means no carbon monoxide. Uh, and dramatic improvement of thermal comfort, as well as extending the life of your pots and pans. No warping, no soot uh, buildup on the bottom, which can make your cooking uneven, you know, create cold spots in your pans. It is going to keep your stuff looking like brand new for a long, long time. So what sort of options are out there? What sort of solutions are out there for these conversions? Well, you have your electric combi ovens, electric steamers, electric griddles, broilers, grills, fryers, induction ranges, tilt skillets, you, you name it, they have it. Uh, there is nothing in the kitchen that cannot be swapped out for electric, period. Uh, and it's also refining tradition, you know? Uh, ethnic cooking, whether it be on woks or tandoori ovens, are already electrified. Uh, a lot of times I've heard on the West Coast, these uh, chefs saying, you know, we can't properly cook in the wok because the flat bottom isn't conducive to creating wok hay, uh, which I get. But they have these concave uh, models that, you know, there's indirect costs that you save. So uh, what people don't know is that when you cook on a wok in a commercial setting, it's about 100,000 BTUs, which you need a lot of water to cool down to cool that down metal does not like that type of heat being blasted and, and, and it'll warp over time so you are constantly running water to the tune of uh, about a million gallons of water per year per unit so if you swap to induction not only excuse me not only are you saving money in operations for you know electricity versus gas not only are you saving money and cleanup time and chemicals and all, this, all sorts of stuff, but you're saving on water, which from what I understand on the West Coast, it is like gold. So cooking can be an opportunity to kind of connect with your ancestors, cook the way they cooked, the, their recipes and things like that. It could also be, it could be almost uh, like a spiritual thing for people. And I understand that. But we are going to be moving away from fossil gas and by adopting these technologies, we're able to preserve those traditions. Yeah. You know, Chris, I've, I've heard this cultural, this piece and, and I've talked to people and it's really that, that fire, right. And there's that mm -hmm. connection to fire and we all have that, right. There's that mm -hmm. aesthetics, that biophilia piece of fire, um, and I know like on the fireplace side, they've tried to solve this by recreating fire all electrically. And I've seen even three years ago, some, something that had me even fooled. Have hmm. you seen any movement of that in the electric space to make it look like there's still a fire? So you have that sort of aesthetics of it, but uh, it's still cooking electrically. <laughs> I don't know. I have not, honestly. Yeah. That's the first I've heard of that. And I, it's interesting to me, but it, I think it's also a waste of money. Yeah, right. It sounds like, it, like yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be expensive just to get right. the look of a flame. Right. Why? Right. Right. I think someone told me like they can see, right. They see how hot the flame is and that tells hmm. them how, like even the though the induction views. tells you how hot, I mean, it tells you, right. The actual temperature. Right. Right. But maybe if there was a flame next to it, that made you also know, you know what I mean? I just, no, no, that's, that's, I mean, and if some people need that, go for it. I mean, I, I, I remember when I first got into my kitchen, uh, and we were working on the induction, it was kind of foreign. I had nobody to train me, nobody to teach me what it was, how it was. We had to figure it out as we went along. Mm -hmm. And the very next day, we, we were feeding over 300 people to kick off the opening of the building, including uh, like legislators and people like that. And it was very nerve wracking to not know how to lead your team to run this, which is why when we started this company, we we said that we, we are training is going to be one of the core things that we, that mm -hmm. we do. Um, but yeah, so it, it would have been nice to have that visual cue, but really it's like, uh, once you take the training wheels off, you're fine. Yeah. yeah. That sounds like a really uh, crazy way to get involved right, right off the bat in induction. Thanks for sharing. Oh yeah. That, so. Oh yeah. It was definitely <laughs> stressful, but uh, despite having everything going against it, I mm -hmm. still fell in love with it. Cause I was one of those chefs that was like, no way this is, this is nuts. Yeah. And after after experiencing it myself, I was like, "Why aren't we doing this?" Yeah. And truth be told, I mean, the rest of the world is doing it. We're truly about thirty years behind. Yeah. Uh, so much so that um, the Culinary Olympics, all electric. Every international competition, cooking competition, is all electric. Mm. 
and we're one of the few countries that refuses to change. Hmm. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully we, we can we can catch up. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, here we go. Heavyweight battle. Electric versus gas. Who's going to win? Uh, I think you can guess where this is going. But again, we're going to try to give gas every opportunity to be successful. So we're going to give it a 50% efficiency, which means you can cook 38.6 pounds of food per hour, which is great. Uh, it's going to need some time and elbow grease to clean. Uh, and the way that happens in a restaurant is you take off, you take off those grates, you soak them in some degrees or scrub them down. You take those individual burners, you would either burn them off, which is just having fire going and kind of burning everything that was, that was kind of cooked on there. And then uh, kind of using toothpicks to kind of go through every single hole to clean that out, scrubbing that down, putting it back together and then lighting those pilots. And then there's a drip tray that you got to pull out. You got to take off the, uh, the foil, scrub that whole thing down, re put the foil back on there and then put it back together. Uh, all, all that costs time, energy, and money. Uh, you're paying your staff, you're, you're buying the chemicals to do that. It can cause burns. It can cause fires. And if they forget to light the pilot light, uh, it can be seriously damning. It can cause explosions and things like that. So it's very important that it's done correctly, but induction 90 plus percent efficiency, which means we can cook 70.9 pounds of food per hour, which is nearly double what you can on gas. Easy to clean, hot soapy water, and you're out of there. Even if you, say, are making a creme anglaise uh, and your milk overboils, instead of it burning on, instead of creating that ring that everyone hates on, you know, on traditional electric appliances, uh, you just wipe it off and you go on about your business. It doesn't, there's no thermal sources. The only thing getting hot is the pan itself, not the actual surface. So when it boils over, just wipe it off. You keep, you keep moving. So it's easy to clean and it's much, much safer to use. Yeah, I was going to ask about the burning piece. You know, I um, use an electric, traditional electric stove just because I'm, that's what came with the house and I'm fine. Right. With that. I'm personally fine with that. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you burn food on that thing. And, and you know, next thing you know, uh, because I have sensors, clean. air quality is, I mean, well, the cleaning piece, yeah, but then even air quality gets diminished significantly because just a little bit of noodle water came out and burned on the pan, right? Or burned around mm -hmm. the edge. Right. Uh, but in, in the case of induction, I assume that water comes out and it, and it can't burn because it's not magnetic or what, what are your thoughts? Yeah. There? So the only thing that would sizzle is any water that that's making contact with the bottom of the pan. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the water just sits there. You wipe it off. You're fine. Uh, right. If your kid comes up and tries to grab something, the handles are, not, are nice and cool. Because again, the only thing getting hot is the surface in which that's making contact with the pan. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the surface in the pan being, be, being in contact, you put your hands all around it. And in fact, uh, for cleanup, my staff used to it's like say they were doing something that was going to be messy, like say tomato sauce, mm -hmm. right? They would put down a towel underneath the cooking vessel, mm -hmm. simmer the tomato sauce and all that stuff. And then instead of uh, it being a mess to clean up, they just pull the towel off and you're clean. Mm -hmm. So because... It, because again, the only thing that's heating up that pan is electromagnetism, which can easily go through a piece of um, cloth. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. So, you know, I, on that note, there's a question here, and maybe you're going to cover it. So feel free to to, sure. to wait if you are. But, um, you know, ventilation, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and do you know if induction truly is safer? It's usually less burning, even even compared to traditional electric and especially gas. Mm -hmm. Do you know if you can downsize um, your ventilation requirements? I know that in the home you can, yeah. Um, but in a restaurant, it's it's a uh, it's you're required that once you hit a certain threshold, that's going to mm -hmm. that's going to create enough uh, cooking vapor, like oil and things like that. You have to have it underneath the hood system. But there are ways to get around that in the sense. Uh, so, like there are ventless technologies out there. Uh, which means they're freestanding uh, pieces of equipment that have their own vet. So you can see, so you no longer um, kind of hamstrung by having to find. So if you're a restaurant owner, having to find a place that has the infrastructure or, or a landlord willing to build in that infrastructure. Um, so you can also completely reor reorganize your kitchen. So if tomorrow, also say Brett, you own a restaurant, you're like, all right, next week, we're going to completely change the menu, something seasonal. Uh, but I think the configuration of the kitchen will work best if it's flipped around or whatever. Uh, you can do that. You just unplug the equipment, move it around. If it's if it's ventless, you don't have to worry about vents. You can completely remake the kitchen however you feel. And if you have a bad landlord, grab your equipment and leave. 
And that right. ventless really only applies to induction, correct? Uh, yeah, electric. Actually, there electric. are some. Uh, there are there are some gas uh, ventless, but uh, okay. for the most part, it the way ventless works is that it's taking the heat and the and the particulates that are coming off of your cooking, like the oil vapor and things like that, cleaning the air and putting it back into your environment. If you're cooking with gas, you're putting hot air back into your environment. So, I you know, I wouldn't recommend it. Can mm. you absolutely? And actually, the force in which it sucks up is so great that it actually cools down the air, but it's still hot air. Mm-hmm. But if you're but if you're electric, you're not like your kitchen is still staying cool despite the fact that you're not now sending the uh, any particulates out to the atmosphere. You're kind of there's a five stage filtration system as well as built in Ansel system. Oh, okay, uh, so, it's, so it's like an advanced filter. It's ca- exactly. cause like right now most residential ranges you just you know, you, you really can't capture that stuff. It kind of just oh. spits it back out at you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This one has a, has a, has like a, the baffle and it has a, a HEPA filter, a charcoal filter. It has a bunch of different filters on there and it, they all tell you when it's time to change, uh, clean, whatever the case is. So, it, mm. and then you can just pick it up and, and walk away. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And then we'll also go into the hood system that I had that worked with our geothermal system. Uh, amazing piece of technology. And, uh, Honestly, I wouldn't imagine building a restaurant without it. Great. Thanks. Sure. So com- continue on with the comparisons, uh, wok cooking. So you have this giant piece of equipment that's 100,000 BTUs, uh, 19% efficient. You can cook 124 pounds an hour. And here you have a much, much smaller 5 kilowatt plug-in uh, wok, right? Uh, that could be taken anywhere you want. Put it. It's actually it's put it up, put on a countertop at the moment, and uh, you can cook 117 pounds of food per hour. So for the same space that you can have that gas wok, you can have coolers. I don't know, two or three plug-in walks, and you can and and instead of having one person manning one station, you can have one person manning three different three different walks. So it's uh you can now do more with less. So here's some quick comparisons uh, with a 30,000 BTU burner at 35% efficient. And again, that's under lab conditions, truly in the field, it's somewhere in the twenties because things aren't maintained as properly things or ran the way they should uh, 10 kilo, 10, 10, 10 BTUs going, sorry, 10 kilo BTUs going into the food, into the pan. Uh, and, but with a five kilowatt burner, get a uh, induction burner at 85% efficiency, you get much more than that. So you get a 40% increase going into your food, uh, which is how we can cook much more, uh, m- more food faster because more energy is going into, into the pan, boiling that water, searing that piece of chicken, whatever the case is. Uh, with woks, 100,000 BTUs at 20%, you're having 20,000 BTUs going into the pan. And you can see how as we add more electricity, more electrical power to the wok, it, it far surpasses it. A 12 kilowatt uh Walk is going to produce uh, 35 kilo, kilo BTUs as opposed to 20 kilo BTUs. And truth be told, that's not even the top end. You can have a 16 kilowatt that's way too much power. What they started doing actually is they started building these walks. And then as they realized like this is too much power, they've been tapering it down and finding that truly you need just a five kilowatt, which is just a 220 plug, plug right into, into that wall. And you can go on about your business and um, put out tons of food with minimal space. So cost comparison, everyone's worried about cost. How much is it gonna cost because electricity is more expensive than gas? Well, assuming that you're working a six burner range uh, on both gas and uh, gas and electric, assuming you're open 360 days a year, 15 hours a day, a dollar per therm, which is a dollar per 100,000 B, uh, kilo BTUs, uh, and 17 cents per kilowatt hour, it's going to cost you $1,123 $1, a year to operate that gas range. But that same assumptions for induction, $1,114 uh, $1, a year. And that's not to say like, look, we saved nine bucks. We're clearly better. The thing is electricity is more expensive than gas. It doesn't have any of the, sub. it has nearly, it has virtually none of the subsidies that gas has. So even with all these things driving the price of gas down, it still cannot keep up with induction, not only in terms of speed, in terms of uh, your operation, in terms of how safe it is, and in terms of cost. It's honestly like baffling why we don't move forward. 
there's even new technology out there like these uh these uh rationale tilt skills the varial cooks the varial cooking center that can be a place to hold your food to cook your food can be uh they're, they're they have bigger bigger pieces of equipment that even uh the way it works is you can kind of put baskets in there fill, fill it up with pasta you know you can set whatever program that you want it'll fill it up with water boil that water and drop your pasta and agitate it and then drain the water and fill it up fill it up with cold water and shock it like all without having any kind of interference by a human being which in the world that we live in now with these uh worker shortages it's huge uh you have electrolux these these combi ovens are designed to say you are doing sunday brunch and you're doing a prime rib you fill that thing up with prime ribs have the probe in there set it to a certain temperature once it hits that temperature it cools it down and if you have it say for a retherm program for 6 a.m uh, it's 6 a.m. It's going to turn itself back on, warm up that uh, that chilled uh, prime rib and have it ready for service for brunch. And they communicate with each other, whether it be blast chillers or combi ovens. And then they also are able to send you updates to your phone. And that's not even the cool thing. I mean, there's also radio wave cooking technology, which if you haven't looked it up, look it up. It's insane. So myth busting to go back to some of these new technologies um, and talk just briefly about um, load shifting, peak load shifting in that, you know, you know, here's what happens, whether you're a commercial entity or a residential, you know, they're trying to get us to use less energy from like, and it's different wherever you're at. Right. But like, mm -hmm. for me, it's from two to seven o'clock, but that's when I'm cooking, right. That's when we're all cooking. Mm -hmm. That's when kitchens are probably really busy. They're mm -hmm. using a lot of energy during that time, and yet we're being asked or being charged more. So I'm curious if um, you have any thoughts on that, and if some of these new technologies, like you're mentioning here, mm -hmm. can sort of pre-cook when you know when energy costs are down, high carbon emission uses is, is down, mm -hmm. and then have it ready. I mean, what what are your thoughts in those contexts? So, so I personally think that there should be an exception for restaurants and hotels, <laughs> right. and, and you know, mom and pop restaurants. I don't think that it's a uh, I think that if you're will, if you want to stimulate small businesses, kind of cut them, cut, you know, cut them some slack. Here in Pennsylvania and like on the East Coast, we don't deal with that. Um, it's you know, it's the same cost no matter what time of time right. of day that you're that you're using your electricity, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but these new technologies that are coming out, like this combi oven, one to one, that combi oven filled with all the bells and whistles versus another combi oven, which is standard combi oven, you it's a five percent reduction in operating costs. Mm. Which means that as these technologies are coming out, they're they're they, they need less and less energy to run. They're running much more efficiently, which over time will save you money. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so there are technologies out there that are coming out that are more efficient than their previous counterparts, and I do think that we need to kind of support our smaller businesses that way. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So let's go into myth busting. This is uh, the chef who. Every time I talk to a chef about changing from gas to electric, this is the face I see. He's a big, strong, burly guy telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. And then he's, then he's saying that this is why we can't go to all electric. Well, first and foremost, cook, induction cooking speed's exaggerated. It's total baloney. Well, we just showed you that that's not true. Uh, where it, if you took a gallon of water at room temp, you can boil that water in about two minutes with induction uh, and about eight minutes with gas. That's what we're talking about. It's uh, not even close. Sautéing is impossible on, on induction. Uh, and they're saying that because once you remove the pan, it's no longer connected to, to the induction surface. So how could it possibly cook? Well, it's the same way you do with gas. When you remove that pan, that flame's not following your, your pan. If you did, you'd be a sorcerer. It, when you cook with induction, the heat goes into the pan and the pan holds onto that heat while you sauté. Uh, Cooking principles don't change because the, the, because the technologies change. Chefs or home cooks can't preheat their pans, therefore cannot saute pro properly. This is a peek uh, behind the veil, folks. Uh, when you're in a restaurant and you're on the saute station, a lot of chefs will have a stack of saute pans with the burner cranked on high. So the, those pans are hot all the time. Whether, whether, the, whether people are ordering from them or not, it's always hot, ready to go, so that way they can grab it and start cooking immediately. That is incredibly wasteful. So when I said earlier that 35% efficient uh, on your gas range, 
um, at lab conditions because in the in real world application, it's never used the way it is in, the, in a lab. It's always abused and you, you use wastefully like uh, like these chefs who preheat their pans like that. And truth be told on induction, heat is so instantaneous that you don't have to preheat your pans. You can take a pan ice cold, toss some toss some vegetables in ice cold, put it on, put it on your induction, turn it on. And within seconds, you're at a full saute. Cooking with gas also gives you much more control. And that's uh, going back to what Brett and I were talking about earlier with that visual cue. Um, and truth be told, it doesn't give you more control. Uh, it gives you the illusion of control. Because if I were to say, Brett, I need you to uh, sear some short ribs and then braise it on medium low. Well, you're going to sear it to what you think is a, is, is a proper sear. And then you have medium, you have low, and you have this big kind of threshold, which what is medium low? It can, and you can under and over braise items. So now my restaurant is going to be not as consistent in my product because uh, we all have different understandings to what's a good sear, what's what's in, in, in what medium low is. But if I were to say, Brett, I need you to sear those short ribs at 435 degrees Fahrenheit at four minutes on each side, then braise it at a level two, I just created consistent a consistent recipe that now every single chef who's working that station can follow. So it doesn't matter what day you go into my restaurant, it is going to be the short ribs that you had the first time you showed up. So you get much more control. The illusion of control is just that flame. Induction cooking technology does not accommodate wok cooking. We just showed that's not true. Uh, that used to be true uh, maybe like 10 years ago. Not true anymore. Glass surfaces on induction equipment will crack and warp because it's not getting, it's not able to withstand a professional kitchen setting. This guy, look at him. He's huge. If he cracks that, no, he's going to, he, he's going to be rough with the equipment. He's going to crack it. He's, he's, he's saying it's the glass surface. It's nothing. Um, well, let's dive deeper on that because it's not just a glass surface. It's tempered ceramic glass, which is much, much stronger and will not warp. The difference between tempered ceramic glass and tempered glass is a big difference. So tempered glass can withstand temperatures of about 600 degrees Fahrenheit, which our ovens can get up to 5, 550, not 600, but still uh, way too close for my comfort. Uh, but tempered ceramic glass can, can far exceed 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, which I don't know a single oven, unless you're putting a kiln on, on top of your range, which is why would you do that? Uh, that's going to get that hot. So, uh, and that actually, that picture is a real five-year-old picture of my range at the time. At the time I took that, it was a five-year-old range and barely a scratch on it. And as you can see, my walls are clean too. Uh, we would have stock pots big enough to hold a whole person into it full of stock running, running day and night. Uh, so, you know, full of bones and things of that nature, very, very heavy, never once cracked, never once warped. These things are designed to handle everything or that you're able to throw at it. Another chef also said that, Hey, I can't honestly have this equipment in my kitchen because I have someone that has, that has a, a pacemaker and metal implants. Um, surgical, first off, surgical stainless, stainless steel is not magnetic. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, if you were to take like a surgical stainless steel pin, kind of put a magnet on it, it won't stick. Uh, st st stainless steel is not magnetic because they they, uh, they they add other other alloys like nickel and things like that to make it stainless. So you you know there are stainless steel that is magnetic, but you have to kind of manufacture it to be magnetic. Um, but truth is, electromagnetic field is very, very low. It's only talking about two or three inches off the surface, the majority of it anyways, which if anybody has ever, which I'm sure we all have worked with floppy disks, you know, if you put a magnet on it, it's going to erase everything on it. So if your phone is able to be close enough to it without it becoming a paperweight, your heart should be just fine. And the, but the electromagnetic field being that low, I highly recommend that you do not lay down on the equipment, gas or electric, not a good idea. Uh, and if that is, if that is occurring, that's a problem with the chef. And I will also posit that the American Heart Association has deemed this perfectly safe as well. So I'm glad you brought up electromagnetic and there was a lot of questions on that. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and, you know, we say here at GHI, you know, use the precautionary principle. There's all sorts of things we can do um, in regards to reducing mm -hmm. EMF. Um, and I think no matter if there's evidence yet that it's an issue or not, you know, I know Europe's been moving forward. So I guess I'm curious if, you know, if any European studies have come out 
on the EMF side and, or if you've worked mm -hmm. with any building biologists to take a look at um, this before. So, yeah. So there was a, a look into the, uh, the EMFs on like the effects on the human body to see like what, um, what's actually out there that, that, that can harm you. And uh, this is what's called, you know, low emitting um, and it's, or oh, sorry, low ionizing EMF. So it's not, a danger to us at all. Uh, our actually our cell phones put out more more EMFs, and we are actually connected to it nonstop. Uh, and that has showed time and time again that it's perfectly safe. There is no adverse reactions to having, you know, this low ionizing radiation around us. Uh, it's only when you're when you get to the high end, of, you know, the the higher kind of the X rays and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's when you get um, into some issues. But the the uh, electromagnetic frequencies coming off of induction is negligible and not dangerous whatsoever. Great. Thanks. Absolutely. So what are the truths around induction? Well, truth is that it gives chefs more power and control. It's safer to use. It's easier to clean. It's going to save you tons of money, energy, and CO2. I'm talking, you're going to save money on labor. You're going to save money on chemicals. You're going to save money on water. You're going to save money on so much to just maintain your equipment. And uh, flat tops, it's, it's indistinguishable from its gas counterpart. As you can see, those digital readouts, you can set it to the degree, again, unparalleled control, extremely quick warm up, uh, easier to clean, saves you all that fun stuff. You're going to see uh, a running trend here of saving energy, money, and and the uh, potential carbon that you're putting out. Um, electricity doesn't also doesn't always have to be an induction. This is our triple deck oven uh, with two built-in proofers that we would use for the bake shop. And again, much, much more control than our gas counterparts. We can set to the degree what we want our bottom stone to be, what we want our top element to be, and even what we want our, uh, what we call the heat shield, which I'll touch on in a second. So what that does, it allows us to kind of, if we're making pizzas, we set that crust and then we have the top element slow. So it just melts the cheese and browns it perfectly. So we have a nice crispy, crunchy crust and a nice uh, soft velvety top. Uh, we're also able to inject steam into our, into each individual uh, compartment, which allows us to set crusts on like bread, like baguettes and things like that. And the heat recovery, when we open up that door, uh, heat's not rushing out on us. That heat shield that we talked about, it's essentially like a downdraft of heat uh, that, is, that is keeping the rest of the heat from, from, the, from the container or sorry, from the compartment coming out. So we can be in there messing with pizzas and breads and pastries, whatever the case is, without worrying about it having to bring the temp back up because that can do some damage to our bakes. Um, and again, all that savings. Induction warmers, unparalleled control. It has a digital readout. We can, we can set it anywhere from 130 degrees Fahrenheit to 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, sleek design that we, uh, th that we implemented was very nice for guest-facing interactions. No steam tables. They also do make one that is a traditional one that kind of like drops in, uh, which again, no, with no steam, when someone goes to swap out uh, pans or whatnot, you're not going to burn yourself. Uh, much easier to clean. Again, hot, soapy water, totally fine. And all that fun savings that we talked about earlier. Now the hood systems. What we had was a variable airflow control uh, that had remote monitoring and adjusting with heat recovery, which saved us tons of money. And we'll talk about that here shortly. The way it worked is it had these sensors built in. It had two, two stages of sensors. This one sensed the cooktop. And then there was one within, within the vent itself. So it would scan the cooktop when it noticed that it was something was getting hot. It would kind of ramp up uh, the, the flow of air coming through. And then whenever, whenever it noticed that we stopped cooking, it kind of would ramp back down and turn itself off. Uh, and it also worked with our geothermal system. So the way it worked is it captured the heat from cooking and then, and, and then it heated up uh, the propylene glycol coming off of our geothermal wells to about 72 degrees Fahrenheit, which we then piped it through microtubing that radiated out and warmed the building. It didn't matter whether it was winter or summer, we were always warming the building because the geothermal wells at that depth, the propylene glycol that was coming up was 500, sorry, was 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So we had to warm that up no matter what time of year. Otherwise the place would be an ice box. So also 
had the ability to track the efficiencies in real time. This particular day was a slow day and we were running a 94% efficiency. Because instead of someone coming into our kitchen at 6 a.m., turning it on, it being on 100% nonstop, it, because it would ramp down, we, we, we can see that we were saving a significant amount of money. Uh, we were only using 6% of the energy that we would normally be using. It was able to identify errors in real time, and it was able to track the, the usage by individual hood. Here you can see that the average of all, all the hoods were just under, uh, sorry, a little, a little over 2,500 CFMs. So that was where we had a lot of savings. Go ahead, Brett. Well, I'm curious, just from my own understanding, you know, I know a lot about home ventilation and to some extent commercial. Do commercial kitchens tend to rely on the cooking hoods as the sole ventilation for the entire space or is there additional ventilation brought in as well? Uh, pretty much, yeah. So that uh, that would have uh, the kind of return air and all that stuff. So it would be the sole ventilation essentially for the kitchen. Okay. Uh, and, you know, people say, you know, hey, all this stuff that you're talking about, like the PM 2.5, the byproducts coming out, that's what the hood system is for. It's going to suck that out of there. So what's the real concern? The real concern is that we are standing directly over those flames and those hood systems are above us. So in order for it to capture, it has to go right past us. Nice. So that's what, that's what we're breathing in. So it doesn't matter how good the hood system is. The yeah. hood system is there to make sure that the rest of the building doesn't get smoked out okay. if you know from steam or anything like that. Uh, if we're blackening, whatever the case is, that's what that's there for. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we are still breathing in those harmful particulates. Mm -hmm. And do you um, typically have makeup like supply air then coming in? And then I assume to make up for the correct, the, the lost air, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. But it still doesn't uh, cool down the space the way, the, the way we need it to. Right. Well, I yeah. have to say we're all sort of like looking at this as residential folks, I see some comments and we're all like, why don't we get these nice things <laughs> for our homes? Like how cool I would think... this be? I've never heard of a heat recovery. You know, we try to ask the, the ERV folks to vent our hoods and they're like, don't, nope, the grease will wreck our system. <laughs> so, yeah. If we can do it, you can do it. Yeah. Well, hey, I have to say everybody, we are at our time. We're going to keep on going because this is an amazing conversation. We have a little more things to cover, but for those of you who are this just is the trying last to, slide anyway. Yeah. For those of you who are trying to get your CEU, I do have to be fair for your time and say you are dismissed. You are approved. If you were here for the entire 60 minutes, you can go mm -hmm. if you have to go, but I hope you'll keep, we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of conversations, so cool. we're going to stick around, but awesome. I wanted to let you all know out there, you're going to get your CEU. If you've been here the whole time, you're good to go. Um, and I'll let you continue on, Chris. So yep. thanks. <laughs> and for those leaving, this is this is the last slide, just showing that the gray bar is what the what the hood systems would be if it's running 100%, and the blue is what we were actually using. Now, talk about cost disparity. A hood system of this size uh, for a traditional like you know constant flow hood system it was about a hundred thousand dollars. The one that we put in was $300,000. And that's the one I'd love to bring up because it's the biggest cost disparity. We, we talked about how induction is not that much more than, than gas, but this was massive. And we were projected to pay it off in 14 months, which is great. But because of how efficient we ran the kitchen, because of how the, the menu we designed, uh, we ended up paying it off in nine months, which means in nine months, we saved $300,000 off our electricity bill just by this piece of equipment alone. So that's what the efficiency does for you. It saves you money in the long term. So people say, wow, that, you know, that cost is still so much. But in less than a year, in three quarters of a year, you made that money back. So now everything else from then on is just profits. You know, it's just money going back into your pocket. And that's the end of, that's the, end of the presentation. So do we have any questions? Lay it on me. Yeah, there are lots of questions here. And before we get to those questions, just again, a real quick uh for those of you watching this on demand in the future not right now please take that quiz with an 80 percent passing rate you can take it on our thinkific channel usgbc channel whatever future channel it might end up on uh make sure you take that you can get your ceus for those of you watching this live right now again just a reminder certs at gutenberg certs.com check your spam you'll see your certificate there mark them as safe so you can make sure you get that and again, before we get to all those questions, again, I have to say a huge thanks to all of our, um, our board of directors, our outgoing chair uh, this last year, Emily Petz, thanks for her work, uh, our new chair, Kay Rose, our executive director, Jose Reina, 
uh, all of our volunteers, speakers throughout the years, and our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi Ream, April Air, and Build Equinox, everyone who allows us to kind of do what we do. So there is just an enormous amount of questions in here, and I don't think we'll get to them all today, but I'm glad, Chris, you offered to stick around and hang out with us for a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Uh, and try to see if we can, if we can um, tackle some of these. So let's just start with the one here. Do you have, um, uh, and maybe this is a link you can send out later, but just mm. what kind of uh, authoritative research, you know, do you have to reference some of these uh, pollutants and particulates that you would recommend if someone wanted to follow up on, you know, indoor air quality issues from gas stoves? Right. Actually, we just uh, wrote the decarbonization guide with the William J. Worthen Foundation uh, and th in the kitchen chapter with all that information, links and, and, and the studies are all, are all in there. Um, graphs, anything that you want to source, it's completely free. It's going to be coming out very, very soon. I think uh, next month, maybe. So um, I don't have that available right now, but that is, but that's going to be in there. Um, as far as also, there is, uh, I think Harvard put out a study last year detailing the cost of uh, cost of doing business, if you will, of cooking with fossil gas. So definitely check that out. They partnered with RMI to put that out. So those are some places I would definitely check out. So um, William, William J. Worthen Foundation, definitely check that out. I might have to ask you to put me in touch with them. It seems like this decarbonization guide would be another great topic oh, for to sure. over, uh, this year. So yeah, there's, I believe, seven chapters that touch on residential, multifamily, commercial, uh, embodied yeah. carbon, all sorts of stuff. So it's a very yeah. comprehensive. It took us over a year to write. Uh yeah. probably longer. I, I, I've been on the project for a year and they started well, well before me. So uh, very, very exciting stuff. That's awesome. You, you don't hear too many things about chefs writing decarb guides. So it's so cool yeah. to see you and thanks. For and there was two on there, one residential, Rochelle Boucher and one commercial yeah. myself. So yeah, yeah, yeah both yeah. of us were on there. Uh, so very, very chef heavy and very, very fun to do. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for your, for your efforts doing that and providing your insight. Um, you know, the question from one of our members here, Brian, Brian, good to, good to see you out there. And, and, you know, and, and I think, and I'm sure there's a different approach. So obviously I think a lot of the folks here are kind of looking more at our, on the residential end, but, mm -hmm. you know, short of following, you know, you on LinkedIn and following Rochelle and sending this webinar out to everyone. Those are sort of my top three recommendations. How do mm -hmm. we talk people into this? What do we do? You know, I've heard in the past that maybe there are like libraries in California that have uh, little single plate top plates that you can rent, right? And, and you can say, hey, try it out, right? Like take two weeks, test it out. I've heard of builders like giving this person they're building a home for a top plate just as like a gift for a little while or whatever. Like, what's your recommendation on how do we how do we talk people into this um, and convince them about this? <laughs> uh, very good question. Um, so this is going to sound bad, but it's true. Uh, get chefs to have more conversations like this. Like Rochelle and I do as much as we can, but we need to take the conversation to a more broader national audience. Chefs enjoy this level of celebrity, which I don't understand, but I'm happy to leverage in order to get the in order to get our message out. Um, so having chefs talk about it, you know, we beat the authority of culinary arts and say like, Hey, this is legit. Uh, we're all doing this. Actually, some of the best restaurants in the world. No, I just won the best restaurant in the world, all electric per se, Alinea, French laundry, pineapple and pearl. He, he, those restaurants here in America, all electric. So there's a lot of places that are all electric, including some schools out in California. Now there are programs like the, um, the kind of, kind of uh, the loaner program uh, that allows you to kind of try it at home, play with it and then see if you like it. And then from there you can purchase it. And um, I'm going to be working with uh, a few organizations this year where we're going to be writing uh, kind of a, an incentivized program. So if you want to say, make that switch, there is some government money there to help you. Uh, we're also going to be, uh, writing more op-eds, trying to get this conversation out, but also reach out to me directly, right? If you want me to speak to somebody, if you want Rochelle to speak to somebody, if you want us uh, to kind of be advocates for, for a target audience, reach out. Uh, Brett will share my information, but this is something I'm very passionate about. We need, like, like I, I read through the entire IPCC report. It was very, very difficult to read, uh, but 
it was important and it kind of opened my eyes to like, I am so glad I'm doing what I'm doing because we need more people to be inspired. So I'm, uh, I'm doing my part trying to speak to chefs. I just got elected to the, to the national board, sorry, to the, um, to my local board of the American Culinary Federation chapter. So I can speak to chefs directly. I have a uh, bunch of speaking engagements this month alone, um, speaking directly to chefs. And uh, I'm hoping to speak at, a, at, the, at the national conference for the ACF. And uh, I was also nominated for chef of the year here in Pittsburgh. So hopefully that can get that profile out. So people understand like, oh, this isn't just like a fad. They're real. This is really happening. Um, but there's a lot of chefs who are also on board. And we're building a coalition of chefs to be able to speak to this stuff. So um, reach out and let's, uh, let's, let's get the conversation started on how we can get other people involved. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now, uh, you know, there were some questions here about, um, you know, specifics and i certainly don't want to get down the sort of brand rabbit hole by any means, mm -hmm. but maybe just having a conversation at a high level, but first mm -hmm. starting with a specific question. Um, one of our members from, um, the city of Ann Arbor, uh, well, welcome is a member. Thanks. And uh, just wondering, is there induction for uh, uh, ovens or is it only electric? Um, no, not for ovens. Okay. So uh, the way the ovens work is electricity, uh, mm -hmm. but not induction. Induction is a very direct way of getting heat into, into a space, mm -hmm. not necessarily for heating up the air. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no electric induction ovens. Mm -hmm. uh, there are... Like, for instance, that Doyon triple deck oven that I showed, that one was um, heating elements. Mm -hmm. It was just very, very efficient, and it was a very small space. But truth be told, most convection ovens in a restaurant are electric, and people don't even know it. Like most of the new ones that are that are in, that are in your restaurants are electric, and if you were to ask your your staff to light pilot lights, they wouldn't even know where to go because they don't exist. So yeah, the the switches happen for most of the equipment in restaurants, and people don't even know it. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, you know so so following up on that, you know what what's some some uh, good ways that people can uh, you know. There's all these different brands out there, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. the top plate, that's kind of cheap. But once you get into a bigger system or more commercial systems, you're mm -hmm. talking more money to make that decision. What are some ways or some good places people can go and review? Do you do reviews or what are your thoughts on that? That's a good question. I have not done any reviews. I'm actually um, hoping to work with some manufacturers this year to help kind of um, kind of bring that together. Uh, we're also going to be working with the EPA to develop the Energy Star certification for induction so that so, so that there is a reliable way to kind of navigate the market. Uh, this country is so far behind that they're it's essentially the Wild West. It's the last frontier for induction. The rest of the world's on board. So what we need to do is kind of just speak with, uh, like, if you're a restaurant, speak, ask your rep, see if they have sold the equipment and ask to be put in contact with them with those customers and see if they can give their honest feedback because the reps are going to try to sell it to you. They don't care. But uh, as the end user, you want to know from someone who is also an end user. And that's kind of what happened to get me this uh, into this, uh, into this kind of field where I was running my, uh, my kitchen. And then I had Microsoft reach out and say, Hey, we're thinking about doing this, but we can't find anybody to talk about it. I know that you're doing it. Do you want to talk about it? So we did. And then they decided to go all in on, on induction. So sometimes just, just a simple, like connect me with someone who, you know, is working on it. And then let's have this conversation or go into a showroom and uh, ask to actually work with the equipment. Uh, any showroom worth its salt is going to um, have a chef there to kind of walk you through, explain how the equipment works, let you cook on it. Uh, so we, that way you can feel comfortable with it. Yeah, I was going to bring up showroom or, or maybe another term appliance storehouse, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like I know here in West Michigan, when I walk into an appliance store and I say, let's talk about a heat pump or electric dryer or a, a dishwasher that's Energy Star certified and quiet, they mm -hmm. do everything they can to talk me out of that or make it clear that they have no clue what I'm talking about. And I mm -hmm. feel they're going to do the same to everyone with right. induction. But so do you have any thoughts on, on that? Is it just more like they probably have it there and, and do they usually let you test them out in those so, kinds of appliance stores? 
Yeah. So if you are in, say, San Francisco, you right. go to the Monarch Premium Premium Appliances. You can go there. You can cook. You can enjoy. It. There's a one in Rancho Cordova that's also got a chef there. Uh, chef Ju Schultz runs that one, and Chef Rochelle Boucher runs uh, runs the one in San Francisco. Uh, there's uh, there's other ones. There's one in Miami. So there's one depending on where you're at, depending on your market, they'll have it. And if they're not willing to walk you through the options for what you want, then they don't deserve your money. Uh, people are getting tipped to the fact that where they decide to spend their money uh, is much more influential than who they vote for every four years. Mm-hmm. So, peop- so which is why you're seeing a lot of companies now have taking the initiative to be more, more sustainable because it's not a fad. It's a guiding principle, and people are waking up to that fact. And 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 where they spend their money, the, these companies want to capture that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. So, um, here's a real specific question um, from mm-hmm. one of our members, and good to see you out there, Paul. Um, do you have any induction cooktop uh, recommendations for induction cooktop covers to keep ceramic tops in good condition? What about pan shaking on the ceramic top and potential scratching of the ceramic mm-hmm. top? <laughs> I have, well, I'm, I'm, I have ADHD and I'm a chef and I, I fidget with my pans all the time and uh, I haven't seen any significant scratching uh, over time, whether it be metal for a gas range or, or glass for an induction, you're going to have some little scratches. Just, you know, if you use it, it is what it is, right? Same thing with your car. Try to take care of it as much as you want, but a rogue pebble is going to come and scratch your car. So uh, but it's not going to gouge your unit. It's not going to crack your unit. You're going to be just fine. But uh, yeah, if you're concerned about that and you want to keep it as pristine as possible, cook with a towel. Put, put a towel on, on, underneath your pot. Uh, it's not going to burn. It's not going to char. It's going to be perfectly safe. And it's going to make cleanup a lot easier. Um, another question here is um, indicator lights, just so you mm-hmm. know. These th- I assume, you know, obviously you can't physically burn your hand like you would with an electric or stove or in a gas stove, you would mm-hmm. see the flame or you, it tells right. you that they're still hot. Right. I'm not sure if an indicator light is necessary, but maybe just something that's indicating, hey, you've left this thing on. Do you mm-hmm. typically see that on these? So in a, com- in a commercial, no, because we're trained to assume everything is hot. Right. Uh, but in the residential, yes, there are some that just say, you know, hey, this particular burner was just on, it's on cool down, whatever the okay. case is. So there, uh, depending on your unit, there will either be a light, there'll be uh, a display, there'll be different things that'll give you the, uh, to, let, to, to, to let you know what's hot, what was just used. Uh, so, so some don't, but it's really like, you, you could run the gamut of what the options are. Uh, So when it comes to induction, kind of tailor to what you like. If you like the indicator lights, go for it. If you like a display, go for it. If you like, I've seen even so far as uh, they had displays that would, that would have built-in recipes. So you can say, Oh, I want to make this frittata. Uh, You can start it. And then it will tell you when to shake your pan, when to add your eggs, when to what it will, it'll tell you everything. And it's just built into the, to the unit. Uh, And that was a residential piece, which I was blown away by. And another thing on residential, I will say, I think you're you're about to see is kind of like a changing of the guard. Normally, uh, commercial chefs are the ones that influence the trend in cooking and things of that nature. Residential chefs are much more hip to induction. And what you're going to see is that for the first time ever, the residential chef will influence the commercial chef. So it'll be a chef going, absolutely not. I'll never do induction. This is is dumb. Then they'll be at a dinner party. And then they'll be like, what is it? why don't you have a gas range? I'm like, Oh my God, let me show you this. And then the chef will play with it and be like, wow, I was an idiot for saying that I want it. And it's going to be the consumer influencing the prosumer for the first time ever. Yeah. That's a good, a good thought. Um, uh, another, uh, uh, great observation here. And, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully when someone watches this next year, they're like, what's he talking about? But <laughs> supply chain issues, right. Mm-hmm. They plague everything. You know, let's say we're trying to spec these for a new project or a new mm-hmm. development, you know, something going on. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you seeing or have you seen anything out there that's really limiting the ability to get these versus electric or gas that would give the edge on the alternatives? Uh, yeah. Or is it pretty consistent across the board? Yeah, unfortunately, it's consistent across the board. Everyone is facing these issues. So contra- so contractors I've spoken with are just saying, like, as soon as we have the plan set, we order the equipment. 
Mm -hmm. So that way, when it's ready to go, either they have to put it into storage or it's ready to install the moment that that they're ready. Because I've had restaurants um, and just not be able to open because they're like, well, the equipment's still six months out. And they're like, well, we're supposed to be opening in two months and our landlord is going to want money for the space and we're not making any money. So it's very important that if you're on a project, uh, until the supply chain issue is fixed, order the order the order the equipment immediately as soon as the plans are set. Yeah. Um, uh, just before I forget to ask, uh, sure. would you be able to uh, if we if someone wants to contact you or is there a link to that video clip you shared earlier? Uh, that's just in a uh, actually. Uh, that was an old Nissan Leaf commercial that I just co-opted oh. for the presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, so, okay. yeah, that's why there's like, you know, gas pumps for the for everything. Yeah, the, right. it, it's, it's, it's an old Nissan Leaf, and it's just awesome. Yeah. Uh, and a good friend of mine actually cut that for a presentation that we did, so I just kept it. I loved it. Right. Gotcha. Um, thanks for saying that. So, sure. um, very specific question here. Um, I've seen induction converter disc plates so that non-ferrous cookware can be used. Any experience or opinions on this type of product? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Yeah, uh, I, I'll be honest. I don't understand it myself. So I've seen induction converter discs slash plates uh, so okay. that non-ferrous cookware can yes. be used. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, they're great. Uh, so it's essentially like this little like cast iron like disc that you put on there, it would conduct the heat. So if you, um, uh, an engineer I was speaking to in San Francisco, he was just saying how he got his mother on induction in Greece and she loves it, except that they cannot find like a coffee maker. Cause like the, you know, like my mother has one, like you just put it on the stove. It would just kind of, uh, uh, what do they call it? Percolator. So it, they couldn't find one that was induction ready. And I was like, just get these discs. They're little cast iron discs. You put them on, that gets hot, which then gets your non-induction ready container hot. And he called me a few months later. He's like, it, it was awesome. We went, we've been searching for months. We tried every expensive option. And then here's a $10 piece of cast iron and it worked great. So yeah, no, they're great. And I would highly recommend it. If you have, an, uh, say, a pan that's very sentimental to you, uh, you're like, no, this is my great grandmother's pan. Uh, although it doesn't, it's not going to work on induction. I don't want to get rid of it. Yeah. Those diffusers are great. And in fact, people use them, uh, on gas as well, because sometimes it can be inconsistent if it's not well taken care of. Mm. Uh, so then that way you make sure that the pan itself is, is evenly dispersing the heat. So if you're doing like a spatchcock chicken, for instance, one side isn't going to get burned while the inside is still raw. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, going back to the um, influence piece and um, awareness, and there was a kind of a comment here that I thought I kind of had an additional thought to add to it. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen anywhere some of like the famous sort of food network chefs, you know, highlight this, any kind of featured session? You know, I'm just thinking out loud, like I, my, my wife was a, I was a huge fan of Hell's Kitchen. We watched mm -hmm. that and I could just see him just yelling at someone for using gas and oh, that would just be amazing if we could get that, that would be awesome so, like uh, you know like what, what do you so what do you have you seen anything like that <laughs> uh unfortunately no and if anybody knows anybody in the industry tell them to give me a call because i'd love to go on there and kinda, yeah you need to get on if, there right i would love that yeah if <laughs> yeah. we can get somewhere like top chef i'd love to go on there and like chefs this is induction this is how it works C cook on it for the first time and watch all those guys and be like this thing's insane it's so awesome yeah you know how they talk to the camera but no unfortunately yeah. <laughs> it's not uh, now in America, it's not, but, uh, other, like other countries. So everyone's a fan of the great British baking show. Uh, that's all induction. Mm. Um, uh, I was just, uh, my wife and I got really caught up on watching, uh, like all these baking championships and, uh, and the ones that are from overseas are all induction, all, all, all electric. So it was, it was pretty awesome to see. And I'm like, man, that's when I really clicked for me. I'm like, we are still not even showing this on TV yet. We need to do that. So if anyone knows anybody, uh, connect me with them. I'm happy to take that project on. Yeah, I feel like there's got to be like a, maybe a, a show with a couple seasons where you're just going against gas head on. Yeah. Going against electric head on and, and it's like a blind, you know, taste. Yeah, it, the... it would be awesome <laughs> if the, what was that show? Cutthroat Kitchen. I never seen it, but I know that's about like sabotaging. If someone yeah. gave their opponent an induction 
cooktop and they were like wow it actually cooked a lot better a lot better <laughs> right yeah <laughs> like yeah. Oh, i was trying to sabotage this guy he ended up smoking us because it just cooked so much faster so yeah, yeah that would that, that would be cool but again um it's a lofty goal and i'm hoping that we as we take this to the national stage this conversation uh we can get those people's interest because i would right. love to do something like that yeah it would make, it would make my mother's life <laughs> right right yeah. she would love it um, well, I, uh, you know, we are, I, I, we're a little over time, but I really appreciate mm-hmm. you sticking around to have a nice conversation. I don't see any more specific questions here. So I think we're going to wrap up. Um, cool. can you just briefly real quick, again, remind us where people can go to contact you or learn a little bit more if they want sure. to follow up? Yeah. So, uh, my email is C Galarza at forward dining solutions.com. Brett, Brett will share that. You can find me on Instagram at uh, forward dining solutions LLC, uh, on LinkedIn under chef, Chris, Christopher, uh, Galarza, um, on Twitter dining forward, but truly I I'm mostly active on LinkedIn and, um, yeah, just email me is the fastest way to get to me. And then, uh, on my email, is my personal cell phone. People can call me if they have any questions. I'm happy to talk more about this. This is super, super important to me as a chef. Uh, I This industry has given me a lot. Uh, it's taken me out of poverty and homelessness and given me a career where I now have a home and a beautiful, beautiful wife. And I'm very, very happy with how things have turned out. And it's because of this industry. And right now, this industry is hurting. The pandemic kind of allowed people to really take stock in their life and realize that this is not a sustainable way to work and live. And they've made these changes. I just, um, on my podcast, Sustainable Overload, uh, which we're gearing up to, to, to start season two, we talked to uh, an, an ex-three Michelin star pastry chef who left the industry completely during COVID because she was tired of the abuse. Uh, she was tired of, of, the, of, of the heat abuse, of the, you know, the male ego abuse, of the industry itself, just you know, making it so a 12 hour shift is minimum. So she now is a, is a coder in like a computer coder in, uh, in, in Brooklyn and she loves life now. So, uh, but this industry is so important to a lot of people. And if we can somehow make it, so being a a restaurant worker, isn't so unbearable. They figured out how to give a living wage. Now we got to figure out how to give them an ecosystem where they can create safely and just, let and let them do their thing. So I'm, I'm hoping through my work, we can, we can help doing, we can help do that. And I hope that we can, and if we don't change things, I hope we can inspire the person who does. Great. Well, um, Chris, thank you so much and appreciate you and, uh, you know, for dining solutions for taking your time here today. I uh, hope people can reach out, um, if they want to learn more and, you know, before we wrap up again, we, we want to see you all safe and healthy. We want to see you. We love doing webinars. We're never going to stop, but we want to get back in the real world out there. So we just have to let you know, get vaccinated, get boosted, tight fitting N95 masks right now. You're going to need those. Uh, and we know, you know, despite what your beliefs are and all of that, ventilation, air filtration, humidification, those are going to make us all live healthier and better lives in our homes and our businesses, no matter if there's a... Uh, deadly pandemic or not. We just need those things and they're going to make us all better. So get to work on that wherever you can help us get the message out. Stay safe. Be well. We'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Well said. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.